Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for coming out to our, our presentation for today, barcode for Infor Visual with RF Plus. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank every all the uh, new customers from BizTech, and, and BizTech is a new um, uh, vendor for us, so thank you very much for helping to set this up. Uh, a couple of things that we might want to that you might want to do as we're going through the presentation is if you have any questions, you can simply type into the question box any questions, and uh, we look forward to those questions. So please send them out there at will. And with that, we'll get started because we're a couple of minutes behind right now. So the agenda today, first of all, we're going to talk a little bit about portable intelligence, um, an ROI with with uh, barcoding and using the RF Plus product visual and barcoding, why, she, why you should use RF Plus, how you can get started, and at the end we'll have a uh, little bit of time, save for questions and answers. So first of all, a little bit about us. Portable Intelligence has deployed our WMS solution to well over 100 visual customers. We have over 25 years of supply chain experience. We are a subject expert when it comes to improving your warehouses and performance and we bring all those years of best practices with us to every new and current customer. We enjoy, it's what we do day in and day out, and we certainly enjoy it. And just like, we, just like you, we also use Visual to run our business. Uh, Jeff Lem, who will be presenting today, has been working in the WMS supply chain management for over 25 years. Portable Intelligence came about in 2015 as Jeff wanted to concentrate on the software side. And RF Plus, our main product, has been around for about 20 years. Jeff has an MBA from one of Canada's top business schools and a professional certification in materials management. On top of all this, he's on the steering committee for one of your visual user groups. On the fun side, he's a certified spin instructor and runs weekly torture sessions, I mean uh, spin sessions, from our office where we have a studio set up to do that in. And with that, I will pass it over to, to Jeff. And that's why you haven't been at one of my classes, John. So uh, <laughs> it's so, torture. So on that note, I'll make a special uh, a special class just for you. Well, thank you, John. And that was John Adams, our, our senior account executive here. He's been in the visual market for probably over five years, John. Seven years. Seven years. And uh, prior to that, you were was one of the uh, Infor partners. So uh, great to have John aboard, and uh, he brings a lot of. Um, expertise and experience with visual as well. Um, I'll go through barcoding ROI fairly quickly. Uh, this is something... Can't see the screen sharing on... Sorry? Can't see the screen. See a little technical difficulty here. I understand screen sharing is available. So hopefully everybody can see our screens. And you've got our screens back. Great, okay. So uh, you probably already read this, this slide, but uh, barcoding is very quick, very accurate. Uh, it's been known to increase productivity by as much as 50%, reduces material handling costs significantly, and most ROI is six to 12 months. So I'll get a bit more detail later on in the presentation. Some of the drivers uh, you probably already have um, had had requests from a number of customers or suppliers or Partners, um, labeling requirements—that's what we we hear a lot of a lot about. Government requirements around uh, tracking regulations, particularly compliance around traceability for our food customers, or even safety regs. Um, auditors and finance folks uh, want better and more detailed inventory counts and improve the accuracy of those of that inventory as well. And just sales. I mean, your sales. Uh, you're growing anywhere between you know 15 to 20 percent a year. Very likely you're going to double your your sales in, in over three years, and then all of a sudden does that mean you're going to have double the warehouse and double the inventory? Um, most people don't want to go to that scenario. So the question is, how do you get more efficient uh, with, with respect to your materials? And I thought long and hard about why people don't put the effort into the warehouse as they do, say, their manufacturing processes. And maybe it's out of habit. So I'm going to draw the analogy uh, with your everyday refrigerator. In your refrigerator, you have a number of items. You've got fruits and vegetables, meats and products, etc. And if you're like me, you probably have three jams, jars of jam, a couple of bottles of ketchup, 
Uh, you're probably throwing out um, some fruits and cilantro every now and then because they're not tracked. You know, it's pretty ad hoc. Um, total value, what's in the fridge, is maybe $247. And I got that stat off of Google. And the average fridge size is anywhere between 25 to 30 cubic feet. So not a big loss if you don't track things well. Unfortunately, a lot of people treat their warehouse like their refrigerator and don't track everything. So let's take, let's take a look at your average everyday warehouse. The average everyday, where, everyday warehouse has a number of different parts in it. It has raw materials, has sub-assemblies, has finished goods. It's got parts in between uh, in between processes. It's got parts um, sitting with your supplier uh, out for finishing or galvanizing. I mean, there's a lot of moving um, parts in your warehouse. Typical warehouse is about, you know, if it's 40,000 square feet, you've got roughly 750,000 cubic feet after you take out your aisles. Um, values typically run anywhere from 250,000 to a million dollars in inventory. And believe it or not, there is, um, very few companies actually have a formal tracking system for all that stuff, all that different types of material across that space. So it's almost like your refrigerator at home. So as a consequence, you end up having a lot of waste in the warehouse. A typical warehouse loses two hours a day looking for stuff, which amounts to 400 hours a year. And if you take $30 an hour as your average uh, over, as your average um wage rate, including overhead and burden, payroll costs, et cetera, works up to 12000 per year. Excess inventory, typically a lot of people order uh, buffer stock, safety stock, extra stock for, uh, for whatever reasons, because they know they're going to lose some of it or, they, uh, or they're not able to track it properly. And that usually amounts to about 25000 say, on a value of 250 You got carrying costs on all that excess inventory of, of 20%. Got write-offs due to expiry, obsolescence, and typically um, most people have their write-offs during their annual annual count when they actually find stuff that's either obsolete, obsolete or, or they lost, and that works out to 7,500. Manual inventory count for five people twice a year, two full days, it's around 11,000 in, in time. Uh, directed put away and, and picking where the, where you don't have proper direction to people where to put stuff or pick stuff properly. Loss efficiency is about 30000 And that's just a start. So the total of that works out to roughly 135000 uh, or 677000 over five years, which is the typical life of our system. But we've seen companies use it. A lot longer. So a lot is at stake by not tracking your inventory properly in the warehouse, and which which is my point is that don't treat it like your everyday fridge. The purpose of the warehouse is um, is the warehouse is responsible for the proper storage, handling, and safekeeping of materials, making them available when needed at the lowest possible cost. And that can't happen if it doesn't start with tracking and making your inventory more visible. Some of your um, typical transactions that you see are in red, and um, it's amazingly how complex the warehouse is when you take a look at all these different functions that the average warehouse material handler does on a given day. So it's little wonder that when you when you go into a typical warehouse that we see today, the average tenure of a warehouse worker is well over 10 years. Most people are in their 50s doing this job for the last 20 years, and they really know how to do this. Um, they, uh, I've, I've been told that the typical, uh, I'd say the uh, typical person uh, who starts a new job in the warehouse, uh, the first three weeks are the most critical as whether that person is going to stay or not, given the, the uh, sharp learning curve associated with learning all the tasks in the warehouse. So imagine that sitting in people's heads. So when then people leave or retire from your firm, all this information around all these processes go with them. The typical benchmarks um, that are used, and again, uh, you'll, you'll see that on-time shipments, internal order cycle times are really key. And a lot of warehouses or, or manufacturers have great benchmarks around production, but they don't have any or very few KPIs benchmarks around their warehouse. And as you notice know, in the middle with the two arrows, 
uh, capacity, um, and uh, as well as uh, back orders. That, they're rising in importance because a lot of companies are getting into e-commerce, selling online, and those particular statistics or KPIs are becoming very important to track. But at the end of the day, what I tell our customers is that it's not about tracking, you know, 12 measures or five measures. It's about, about tracking one measure. One of my favorite movies is uh, City Slickers. You'll notice that that's Jack Palace in, in the, at, the, at the right there, Curly. And at one pivotal point in the movie, uh, Billy Crystal asked Jack Palance, says, what is the secret to life? And Jack held up one finger. He said, he said basically, the one thing. He said, the one thing. What's the one thing? He goes, it's the one thing. So, so basically, as in any warehouse, what is your one thing? And the reason why I say one thing is that from there, it's easy to get people to understand that one thing and how it translates into their specific departments. So, for example, if your one thing is to get um, 120 lines picked per hour, what does that mean in terms of having proper put away, proper labeling, in terms of proper, um, uh, in terms of proper order allocation? Uh, maybe your number is, is 150,000 cases shipped per day, or work order shipped, or moves per hour, or totes per day, or box per day. These are real life numbers that a number of our customers use, which is their one thing. So I encourage you to think about your warehouse and say, what is the one thing that we need to track, get everybody on board, and then build our process to sustain that particular one thing. Now we get into R plus for, uh, for M4, uh, visual manufacturing. And this product was built uh, almost 12 years, well, actually 20 years ago now. Today, uh, one of our customers who was a visual user came to us and said to us, you know what, we've been using a number of different barcoding solutions from m and third parties, and we can't get anything to work with visual for whatever reason. And so we said, thinking that we could do anything, said, sure, we could do this, and we'll get to you in three months. Well, to make a short story or make a long story shorter, it actually took us almost 10 months. It was a lot more complicated. Um, visual has over 600 tables. Uh, we purchased the data dictionary, which is about a thousand pages, and we figured it out. And to that end, we built directly into the visual table. So what you're gonna, what you're gonna see in it, what you, in essence, what we have with R Plus is a direct connection in the visual with no time delay. It's our middleware handling all the updates to visual as if you typed it in directly into visual yourself. Right. And now I'm going to talk a bit about uh, the seven stages. A lot of uh, visual ma visual clients typically see themselves as made to order custom job shots, but really what happens over time is that you eventually become a made to stock producer, whether you like it or whether admit it or not, or consider yourself one. And there, and we'll go through those seven stages. And and typically what we see out there is that customers start coming to us around the sixth or seventh stage. So let's start with stage one. In stage one, you're strictly made to orders with link purchase orders to work orders and even COs. Stuff comes in and stuff goes out, no problem at all. As they say, life is good. In stage two, uh, business is growing, so you say, hey, I'm gonna turn on this auto, auto issue function, start using some primary locations. I better start uncoupling some of my POs to workers because I'm having to purchase larger items and I'm using um, those raw materials over several jobs, so makes it rather inconvenient if it's always issued to uh, one work order. So you've uncoupled it, but hey, still very manageable. In stage three, you've got now a bunch of new customers coming to you, larger customers with multiple delivery dates. Uh, you've now uncoupled work orders to COs. You're, uh, you're looking at using concurrent scheduling, uh, using trades for finished goods, uh, and you're building and shipping to delivery dates. So as you get um, the point here, you're getting a little frustrated because things are starting to not work as smoothly uh, within the warehouse and, and, and some of your manufacturing processes. By stage four, you're now um, ordering a lot of raw material in advance, taking advantage of discounts from your suppliers and their lead times. You've got now negative inventory appearing uh, thanks to auto issuing from primary locations and you're going, what's going on here? 
uh, purchasing is all upset when you see these negative inventories, and, you're, and it's causing more frequent counts and going out, out actually to the floor and checking if you have that available inventory before you even order it or even decide to make it. By this point, you're getting pretty frustrated with the team, with the whole setup. And wait, it's going to even get better. By stage five, you now got lots of specialized processes, um, but you're very reliant on people, um, data, um, um, people entering the data. You've got uh, some delays between what's really out there on the floor and your system. And you're finding that your inventory is anywhere from two to three days behind um, what's actually out there on the floor. With all that extra effort, you're just flat out getting tired. And you're now reaching pretty much a tipping point as I say, we can't take on any more additional manual processes and specialized things that people need to remember. By stage five, you're finding that you're now tracking uh, more goods between operations, which are what we call work and process goods. Those are the goods that are not parts per se, but just way for the next operation. And often what happens is as the product moves from, from resource to resource, the operator may not be ready for it, and he or she signals and says, don't bring it here, take it somewhere else. So, so the material handler um, takes it to another area of the warehouse, drops it down, and then goes for a break. Well, guess what happens? The guy goes for it while he's on a break, that operator is now ready for those materials, and now no one can find those work and process goods. And that uh, things like this are happening every day, many times a day, and you're now ambivalent, you don't, you're run out of answers, you really don't know uh, what to do next. By stage seven, you're now getting bigger orders, you're, stock, you're, you're getting, um, you're stocking stock to meet uh, delivery windows, you've got sub-assemblies, you've got raw materials in the yard, you've got external warehouses uh, holding finished goods and raw materials, you've got potential compliance penalties with customers, we're not putting on the right labels, you got to do trace now, and you've also now got your tenured warehouse staff leaving or retiring, and you're hiring millennials, and the challenges around around that younger workforce, and sales tells you, hey, we're now going to put everything online, uh, or our top customers want to show what we have available online so they can put on their particular website so they can over order service parts. But now you're just you're just totally all the answers, and you're you're, you're just scared. So what we, what we do is we see a lot of people coming to us in stage six and seven asking for a solution to basically able to scale their warehouse because, because their inability to scale the warehouse is actually becoming an impediment to growing the business. And these are some of the things you may have heard um, in the warehouse. There are typical signs that you're there. You know, we can make a product faster if we can stop, if we can stop losing all our whip goods. The warehouse is just one big location, so if we're not for guys like Ed, we'd be in trouble. <clears throat> Stuff we thought we lost, uh, we lost, we actually found after the inventory count. <clears throat> and we should be doing trace, but we don't, but we put trace in a notebook or uh, we write it down on a spreadsheet, and that's how we do our trace. And before we book certain orders, you actually go down to the warehouse to check it if it's actually there. So those are the signs um, that you're at that point where you should be looking at a proper system to manage the materials in your warehouse. Now, visual and barcoding don't necessarily work well together, and I'll get into those into those uh, details uh, later on. But the bottom line is, you add barcoding to, to M4. You get a lot of um, gaps appearing because barcoding is predicated on doing data collection, and what Visual tries to do is eliminate some of that data collection with things like auto issue, with things like putting away on mag to primary, uh, with things like moving from inspection straight to the primary location. So it actually moves these goods a lot quicker than anybody physically can. So that results in a little delay, or how they call it, say. Uh, a difference of opinion when it comes to where the inventory really is within your facility. Whereas on the other hand, R Plus was actually built from the ground up to work with visual and to manage both raw materials, 
production materials, production, the production processes, as well as finished goods. As I mentioned earlier, it's real-time, performs real-time inventory transactions with wireless and barcoding technologies, two technologies that most of you are familiar with today. Um, we use best practice that support a receipt of goods at the, at the warehouse, at the dock doors, um, from, whether it be issuing raw materials, transfers in the warehouse, and back to the dock doors for pick and shipping. And guess what? We also uh, support label printing in line with all those processes. So instead of batch printing or printing in advance uh, labels that you may need based on certain orders being processed the next day, you can print them on the fly. And the nice thing as well with RS Plus, we can print labels that are specific to a customer in addition to specific to a certain type of product. So depending on the, the type of product or the type of customer you're producing, for, we can generate those labels on the fly. Also gives you, as I mentioned, inventory control. So whether it's your business rules, we have a number of different system settings in our system. We also have a, a way of, of controlling tasks, um, be able to tell uh, the people on the floor which uh, customer orders are our priority, um, what, uh, where to put certain items, what items to pick if you want particularly uh, FIFO rotation of your inventory. And we track it all. It's all updated in real time to your inventory trans table and visual, for which you get a full audit trail and view of who did what and when and where within the warehouse. And it's really easy to deploy. We call it super simple to deploy. Uh, given our experience, given the deep integration with visual and the fact that we're visual users. So we've had customers start our system, uh, you know, even at the picking stage. So they don't have to, you know, transact with us at the purchase order receipt level and then follow that material right through to, to uh, work order issuing and finish goods receipt. They can, we can pick up your data points, your visual data points at, at seal picking and do picking and shipping. Inversely, we can even start at um, PO receipt and just do receipts against your purchase orders, do put away, support your inspection processes, generate labels. So we can start anywhere along the internal supply chain to support your system. So it's not uh, where you need to populate a separate database that would be your, say, your WMS database, but rather everything we need is in visual. We just access it and present it um, as needed, depending on the type of operation or, or process you're doing. Now, let's talk a bit, bit about um, R plus and how visual uh, together work. I'm going to start with a bit of before and after picture stories, just to give you an idea as to the environment that you're working in on the visual side and in contrast to the environment you're working in on the R plus side. And these are real life pictures that I'm sharing with you and they're not made up or doctored or anything. These are pictures that we see uh, on the floor in most typical places that don't have a barcoding or a proper material tracking uh, uh, solution in place. First, let's start at the beginning with PO receiving and put away. Um, PO receipt data is typically manually keyed in after the product is received next day or a few hours, uh, typically that happens. There is uh, an automatic put away to a primary location done by visual. There's uh, very rarely uh, labeling a product coming in. Um, part inspection, that's done if the person knows that is to be done. Uh, and that's typically, again, tribal knowledge. Uh, trace is not, uh, not used or it's kept out of the system. And that's partly because there's so much um, it's so difficult to track and write down, say, a really long lot number or a heat number or expiry date, and um, where do you put it as well? So, so we, they find that a lot of people on the receiving side find that it actually slows it down tremendously when they have to do trace. Plus, a lot of you are probably doing auto issues, so you don't need trace. But there will come a time when you, where you may need to turn on trace on raw materials and that's where you're st you'll have to start uh, capturing that trace. We have a um, aerospace um, manufacturer, parts manufacturer, and they capture six trace elements per item that comes in. That's a lot of work. 
And if you have a PO, the work order link, all that material that you receive just gets issued to the job right away upon receipt. As a result, your inventory data is out of sync, is inaccurate, and not labeled properly, and the location is sort of unknown, or sort of known, but not accurately. And the picture on the right is a bunch of post-it notes attached to some batteries. And what they write on the post-it note is their internal part number. When that receipt is done, the, uh, the person takes all the post-it notes off and hands them over to accounting where that person does the data entry. She counts the number of post-it notes she receives and then keys in uh, the part number. So how our FUS will handle the PO receipt, or typically, is that PO receipt is done at the point of uh, at the point of receipt, actually on the floor, right? And so that's done by the by the receiver, and as well as they'd be scanning the supplier barcode using the alias function in Visual. Um, part um, maintenance or the part profile in Visual is probably one of my favorite features in Visual because it's so feature rich. And this is one of the uh, this is one of the parts of Visual, the alias function that a lot of people are not aware uh, they can use, and that's basically it allows you to take your supplier part number and use it as your own. And Visual has an unlimited number of um, alias uh, part codes you can use for your own, own internal numbers. So going back to that earlier picture, you'll see below the post note there is a part number for that supplier which begins with um, 5134, et cetera. So all you would have to do is associate that particular part number, begins with, with the number five, uh, with the number that that person has written on his post-it note. So that way you just scan this particular barcode and immediately it gets reinterpreted uh, by visual, first by R plus through visual as your internal part number and bingo bango, you've got uh, now a barcoded uh, product in your warehouse. As well as we can also print labels that receipt with the proper trace information so that if your supplier sends you something that you know doesn't have all the inf information you need, be it trace, et cetera, you can actually uh, print a label and apply it to each product or, or to each case. Um, we also respect any inspection required against each, each part and we put it on hold into its hold location. Um, parts uh, are put away to uh, available or primary location by our system, and so we follow the movement of the product. And if you have a PO to work order link, we allow you to generate a label identifying the work order and purchase order and the location that product is to be stored at. Um, I see a lot of situations where um, people do what I call job boring. They'll take parts that were designated for another job and use them on their job, resulting in some confusion down the line for sure. And lastly, we can also break the link and treat it as inventory. In other words, keep the soft link so that way that connection is kept. In the end, the inventory is visible, accurate, accurate and properly labeled. On to issuing and work, and work in process tracking. You know, in this case, in the world without um, R plus, uh, data is entered into uh, is entered after the project is issued by a timesheet, which you can see on the clipboard on the on those materials. Uh, in this case, kits are created on that particular cart, and they will they will actually issue all those products to the job before it's actually used. So, what if a customer cancels the order, increase the order, or what if they can't find the kit? can't find this cart, and the guy's ready to start the job. Issue returns from the floor not tracked. I see a lot of um, excess extra inventory lying around in production areas. Um, the typical story is that always put it away as soon as that shelf gets full, and might get full after a month or so, right? Um, part inspection is not turned on. So basically, you know, they're, um, the, that inventory is all marked as available, but in reality, it should be on hold. And auto issuing takes um, the standard amount, uh, amount of materials out of the system, which could be off, and that's where you need to do your cycle counts to track that. And there's no tracking of on-the-fly issues to the work order. So often you'll have on-the-fly issues to the work order, 
and that's not um, put in place. And uh, and lastly, you may have a CO work order link, and goods are not um, are shipped after the after you receive. So in other words, those products which might hang here for sale, hang around in your facility for up towards a week before actual shipping to the customer, they're already shipped. So that's a problem in terms of tracking. And John pointed out one thing that I missed, which is the work and process goods are not tracked. And those are the in-between um, uh, materials that are not tracked. So you may have a, a cutting operation, and next might be grinding. And then the grinder will say, don't, don't bring me all that cut product, take it away to another area. And lo and behold, you may not be able to find that that recently cut product because the guy who put it away has gone home or is on a break. The R plus solution uh, results in a couple of uh, neat things happening. First of all, product is issued as a happen and trace is recorded. So in other words, so instead of uh, issuing all the products that you're creating to the kit, you're actually transferring it to what we call a license plate as uh, we see the, uh, the big green circle. You put a license plate barcode on that particular cart, and lo and behold, it becomes its own little location. And, and with that, it gets, it gets associated all the raw materials you pick for that job. Uh, we can do, we capture issue returns immediately, so now it's back in the system and should be used or made available now for the next job. New labels are printed um, for, a, for every return product. Um, whip goods are tracked to what we call a container code. Um, we don't have enough time to get into that on this on this presentation, but but basically what a container code does is it tracks all those particular all, all those in between goods to a particular to a container, which we then track the container to a location within Visual, as well as um, the work order side of things. Um, part inspection is is turned on, and they perform that um, for every finished goods receiving. Um, we use auto issuing. Uh, and we do it, and we support a combination of both auto issuing and manual issuing. And as well, if you have, um, we also give the ability to over issue, issue new cards on the fly, as well as generate substitutes. And we also capture uh, if you do produce um, co products. So some of you who may produce an automotive part might produce also a left hand part along with every right hand part, whereas customer may only want the right hand part. We'll capture that as well. And if you have a CO work order link, uh, we can actually break the link, keep a soft connection, so that way we can actually track those finished goods even though they're technically shipped. On the finished goods side of things, um, we, we will track them, and, and uh, I, what I see is that a lot of people track them to the finished goods area, which is a large warehouse, large place in the warehouse where it contains all your finished goods. Movements are not tracked, it's all by tribal knowledge, uh, or you're keeping an outside warehouse. And in this picture on the right, what you see here is a, is a warehouse with a uh, specific um, bin location, like number 19, and all the parts associated with that particular, that's in that bin that they write down. And you can see the quantity associated with there as, uh, by each part. Subassemblies uh, are not tracked. Um, finished goods are only labeled to meet customer needs, and they're not used. Um, any changes to the pack to the pick list, which is also I find often your pack list, are handwritten. And that's what goes uh, to the customer. And on the work order CO link, it's back flushed out of visual and shipped. So in the end, you've got a system that's very dependent upon people remembering where everything is. A lot of um, not so professional looking documentation, which hurts your image. And there's not a lot of accountability. I mean, people write and update those particular bins you see them write, and what is their order wrong? No one, no one knows who did it. On the other hand, with the R plus solution, everything is scanned to racks, which are in turn labeled barcodes. Uh, if you make changes to the pick list, the, pick, the pack list is printed at the end of the pick, so it's always professional looking and, and accurate with no handwritten um, Notes on it. In the, within the warehouse, all movements are, are captured. If you do between warehouses, we support a function called warehouse transfers, and we also support IBT. So if you're using any third-party warehouses or even IBT between your own warehouses, we can facilitate and, and use IBTs that are created. 
on subassemblies. In this case, we have subassembly here. We're actually scanning those parts and tracking them through work order. And again, if you have a work order CO link, we break the link and track product uh, within the warehouse. In the end, inventory is visible to all and tracked, and you get greater material flow as a result of having all this uh, finished goods tracked. On the material pull side, um, that's where you're now bringing materials to the line itself. And as you know, visual has no replenish, replenishment function. It doesn't tell you when the line is running out of material. You have a guy driving around, or you have lights that you see there, which tells the person uh, when they may need materials. Uh, any uh, reordering is done at the M MRP uh, level based on supply and demand link, which cuts your purchase order, but it has nothing to do with your production. So basically, you've got people driving around the warehouse asking if you need materials. So as a result of that, and even when they bring materials to the line, there's no minimum that they uh, that is that is mentioned, um, you know, and there's no tracking as to you know how much minimums go into uh, for each location on the floor. As a result of this, there's, um, there's uh, and as well as no auto moving of parts to support pick faces, be it for production or shipment. So it's very manual intensive, very visually driven, lots of verbal communications. On our plus side, we have what we call the just in time replenishment function. We designate locations as, as L1, L2, storage locations, et cetera, et cetera and that automatically reorders a replenishment task to be created, and it creates a task list to be done within the warehouse to bring materials to the appropriate area on the line or in the warehouse. We're also gonna be coming out with a new automated demand function, which basically will push materials based on work order issues um, to the floor of finished goods receipt. And now bring the just required amount of it in material to the line so for example, uh, we'll bring say 90 minutes worth of materials to the line and basically update the system every 60 minutes to see um, how that particular resource is doing from a material perspective. So we have, in essence, a 30 minute buffer to bring material to the line. So you don't get the lines ever running out of material. Now just getting into some high level screens around R plus. R plus itself is all, is um, we have two versions, uh, an earlier version, which is Telnet, the character-based system. And about um, a year ago, we migrated all our handheld screens that you see on the right um, it, to web-based screens, which is very colorful. So you have a number of gauges, you have push buttons, you have buttons that you could uh, press either uh, with your finger or, 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 um, or, 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 or cursor. And on the left, you see a, um, an R, R, R plus control center screen, which is their console, which allows you to monitor what's happening within your warehouse, and it also has an R with KPIs. So two screens on your right are, are examples of PO receiving and put away. Um, again, we've got finished goods receiving, and you see the two screens on your right, which are your work order receiving and your finished goods receiving, which are ways in which you get inventory into the system. One of the best features and best ways to sell the product uh, and to bring your team on board is the lookup function. We have a number of lookup functions within the system itself, so you could be you could do a lookup while you're doing a put away or picking, and we have and we also have a lookup function um, which standalones on a, on its own. So you could do a lookup by part, by location, or by trace information. And anytime you do a transfer, you're not sure where to put something or you're looking for a suggested location, um, the lookup function um, through, by clicking on that, which is that the pancake layer that you see next to location, will give you an idea as to where to put things away. Likewise, on inventory counts, we have a number of um, screens that supported on the, on the handhelds. And how it works basically is that you set up your counts and visuals. So you set up your count ID, and that's it. You don't have to print the tags. You create a series of blank tags, and then they go on the floor and they do the counts with that far screen on the right. So you see where they're entering, in this case, a dimensional uh, length and width and height and the, um, the number of pieces associated with it and the location, et cetera, and that all gets captured. Now, it doesn't get update the visual immediately, 
that you still had the review function you could perform on, on the visual side to make sure that that count is then accurate. The bottom line is we found that by using our handheld screens in lieu of printing paper and updating um, visual manually, we're saving companies anywhere from 50 to 80% of the time. And the nice thing is that because we save so much time, they can now actually do cycle counts using ABCs, using location, rotation. Um, either way, they can spend a few hours each week or each day and do a cycle count, and you'll find that that actually benefits the business a lot more than doing an annual physical, which is more of an auditor type check, right? And the nice thing is that once you get your cycle counts up to 97% accuracy, you basically eliminate the need to do an, an annual count altogether. Likewise, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we do QC hold and release so that, again, we respect any settings within visual um, that you set up uh, as a QC hold for a particular part, and then we bring it up on the screens for them to release on an as-required basis. Picking and shipping, and this is probably one of our, our richest functions here because there's so many different ways of you can pick and ship, um, but in any event, uh, we take your COs, uh, we schedule your COs, and then basically those are the ones that the people work on. Um, we could do batch picks, we can do wave picks, et cetera, et cetera. Around that, we could also print pack lists, shipping labels. Um, we also produce uh, bills of lading, um, almost any variation you want. Um, we also can produce an ASN if you need to send to a customer, um, which is what they're getting from a, a batch ship notice. <clears throat> Some typical label samples we produced in the past are your standard, uh, you know, just material labels, a finished goods for label, as well as an AIAG label, and even RFID labels we can generate. All right, so I'm going to, we only have 15 minutes left, so I'm going to wrap up and, and talk a bit about how to get started um, with your barcoding project, and this is drawn from some of our best practices and experience of doing this for over 20 years. The key ingredients, of course, are parts, locations, data points, and you could probably guess where that comes from. That comes from your friendly neighborhood um, in for visual product. Um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, visual has everything you need to manage inventories. Unfortunately, it's just hard to get at. It's a bit um, siloed. Of course, you need our system, R Plus, which is going to take all that wonderful data and setups and configurations within Visual and then apply it to the proper management of your warehouse as well as the warehouse team. And then you need your, your collection tools, which are like your Wi-Fi, which many of you have, but maybe you don't have it in the warehouse, your rack labeling and your, and your barcodes and your product and of course your data collection devices. And we have very specific requirements around your around data collection, and so you definitely need to consult us. Although we don't sell the hardware, we have specific um, part number configurations that are, are, that are to be purchased for use with our product. I decided to make to put together a top six deployment practices of what I've seen worked. Top one is assemble a project team comprised of a, a number of cross functions, so it includes a project manager, an IT person, somebody in finance, somebody in operations, and a sponsor. The sponsor should be somebody at a high level, i.e. the owners or senior, senior management, SMEs, subject matter experts, uh, experts, or people who are your power users. So rather than pulling somebody off and putting them on the barcoding project, do a point um, um, how they call it responsibility, where you bring in, say, the purchasing per uh, sorry, the receiving person, and have them be your inbound SME person, where he or she would advise on how to how they uh, receive the items. So that way, when you go through, they can set up a configuration of R plus. We capture all those particular exceptions and processes associated with, say, inbound. Number two, apply barcodes upon receipt of materials. You know, be it raw materials. Uh, use the alias function <clears throat> on finished goods. Um, use label printing and include it as part of the re finished goods receiving process and get a label on those goods coming off of the line. 
use barcode trace data, stop tracking it in notebooks and spreadsheets and uh, whatever else you've seen. I've seen companies, you know, have a stack of books, each and each book representing, um, you know, uh, trace information that was produced over the years. You know, trying to find that would be very, very difficult. Visual is already built to track all that trace information. It's just a matter of setting up and using it. Bar barcode your locations. And get fairly granular. Don't make one giant location called finished goods, right? Get get granular. And we use uh, an acronym called ZABO, Zone A Bay Level Bin. And you may only want to start with just say, your aisles and your and your bin, your aisles and your bays, for now. So you might have one particular bay, even though it's it's three or four levels high. That would be one location. You can always get more granular later on. But having a level of granular is important because it minimizes the amount of searching within any specific location. Look at doing cycle counts, and as I mentioned earlier, using ABCs, locations, or product, or by area. And again, we can help you set up how to do your cycle counts. And we are coming up with a module as well next year that's going to be your cycle count scheduler. And then capture data at the point of transaction. So don't wait. Don't put a delay between something happening and then later keying it into the system. I've seen a lot of people put a terminal on the floor, which is a visual license, and then they expect the warehouse people to key in every transfer or key in every issue, or key in every return, or whatever that may be happening, and guess what? It doesn't happen. People forget to do it, or they do it um, uh, very late, or they do it inaccurately because they're not using barcodes. And those are just some of the examples below where you would consider to do um, capturing things at point of transaction. Here's some sample location labels and what they can look at. You can do stacked labels. You can do labels on the floor, which don't really last and they wear out over time. You can hang your labels from the rafters, which are great for floor stack type options or situations. And then you can put um, big labels on the racking itself. And you obviously need to make them bigger the higher up you go. And again, we can consult you as to uh, the size of the label you need to, say, get a 20 or 25 foot scan distance. And we have a 60 day deployment model. So uh, what we try to do is say, within the first 60 days, let's try to get a W on the board, and that could be, say, the inbound and, say, inventory count. And how it looks like is that in the first 30 days, we do the project kickoff, we do a process called BRD, which stands for Business Requirements uh, Documentation, or go through all your processes and identify how you do things today, and then and then basically that sets up for how we would configure our plus and what steps in your processes we would actually eliminate. We do any functional specs, if there's any enhancements or customs required, we set up the system, and then we do a deployment in the test. In the next 45 days, we do a lot of testing uh, and use case, uh, uh, running use cases through the system, just so that we make sh we make sure that we're capturing everything. And then in the 60 days, we do a process called PV, which is process verification, where we really um, put the system through its final paces to make sure. We then do a UAT, a user acceptance test, and then we deploy to a live environment and we go live. When we do it this way, we find that go live is pretty much a non-event. Um, because we've done so much upfront testing and, and, and setting up and using your data set to make sure it works. Some other reasons why inventory matters is I mentioned this earlier that 97% cycle count accuracy eliminates the annual physical. Improved inventory turns means not having to build new additional facilities um, for warehousing. Um, you reduce your inventory by increasing your turns, and it, which in turn increases your return of assets. And as you may know, as you well know, inventory is often the largest item on your balance sheet. That's fact, a, a reduction of $50,000 in annual obsolescence or write-offs was the equivalent of an increase of a million dollars in sales, assuming a 5% net return uh, on, on uh, net income. And that's a huge number. So, so if you don't have to write off $50,000, 
somebody doesn't have to go out and sell a million dollars worth of sales to make up for that lost inventory. And lastly, um, one of the reasons why we see a reluctance to invest in the materials handling process, other than you know maybe we see it as a big fridge sometimes, is that really material handling adds no value to the finished product, but can account for up to 60% of the entire manufacturing budget when you include transportation, acquisition, control, and handling. Right? Some resources that, um, that you can refer to, um, some blogs, there's um, plenty of information on our website. We've also list, lately posted a blog on the Biz um, Tech uh, website, or will be coming up shortly. Um, there is the Warehouse Education Research Council, which is a fantastic uh, resource for everybody, um, number of supply chains, and then the Material Handling Society of Ontario, which um, has a wealth of information around warehouses. And we drive drive a lot of our information from that, as well as best practices. Right. So uh, it's now question time. And just a quick note is that we will be at Visual Focus um, next month uh, with the uh, with BizTech, uh, Synergy, and uh, and Visual itself. So we look forward to seeing there. And I'm going to open up um, if there's any questions from the from our audience out there. Go ahead, John. I'll leave it to you. Oh, we we had one come in. Um, Jeff, which versions of Visual does R Plus support? We we support um, going back to six five four, right? And so um, with our Talnet version, we can go with six five four, uh, and certainly um, from seven up, we can go with our web um, version of our software. Excellent. Uh, another question is, uh, will there be a recording available after the webinar? Uh, yes, we're going to make the recording available. Uh, we'll email you a link, and there'll also be um, the slide deck as well. Um, next question is, does the WIP tracking track all the way back to the raw material? Um, yes. So, so the WIP tracking will track the issuing of raw materials to the work order, any issuing re return um, to the work order, as well as if you set up our plus, we can over issue as well. Um, so, so, and that's on a raw material part. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we can also track the in-between processes and the materials that come off of that as well. Um, we also have a way of handling outside service. So it's, this is a case where you send the part out for say painting or galvanizing or rust proofing. Uh, we can actually track that that particular um, group of parts and work order has gone out to that particular vendor. So I hope that answers your question. Next question is, on picking, do I understand you can batch pick? We sometimes will make two or three work orders that are the same and want to pick one time for all three. Uh, yes. Yeah, yeah. So on the, on the work order side, we can do a batch pick and then drive that person to pick all those um, parts at once, but against each specific work order. Um, Next question, lots of good questions. Does RF Plus handle the creation of warehouse locations in visual, or does that need to be done um, in the visual software with, with other types of people? Yeah, it has to be done. We don't create the locations. We follow, those locations are created in visual, and then around the location setup, we encourage you to indicate, you know, uh, you know, what parts are available for it. Um, is it a whole location or available location? So, to make, a sh uh, to make it a short answer, yes, it has to be set up in visual, but it's also important um, that you have certain security access to that area, and we could also certainly help you in terms of deciding how to use which nomenclature. So, for example, if you use the acronym ZABL, uh, location would have, say, the zone, the aisle, the bay, the level, and the bin. A lot of customers don't go to that level of detail, uh, but nonetheless, that gives you an idea as to how to um, number and create a, a location sequence within your facility. Great, thanks, Jeff. And the last question I have here, is this a replacement to BTS? Uh, yes, it is a replacement to BTS. I mean, having said that, 
If you like B if you like using BTS for certain functions, we can certainly coexist with BTS. As I mentioned, both BTS and R plus both work off the same one database, which is visual. And one last question is here. If a customer order is shipped with a linked uh, WO that has some material items not set up to auto issue in visual, will it auto issue anyways? Um, sorry, can you repeat yeah. that question? If a customer order is shipped with a linked uh, work order, uh, sorry, um, work order and, and customer order, that is some material items not set to auto issue in visual will it auto issue anyway anyway no no we we will we we res, we won't auto issue any materials unless it's set up in visual hope that answers the question those have to be manually issued um to the work order using our our um using our scanners or or the other our, our application great um, and just there's a lot of questions around will there be a recording available? Yes, there will be a recording. We are going to send out a copy of the of the presentation. And if anybody wants any more information, um, you'll see the last slide deck. You've got some some contact names and numbers that you can reach out to, and be more than glad to have a uh, a further um, conversation with you. With that, we will say goodbye and thank you once again, everybody, for attending the webinar today. Are we giving Starbucks cards? Oh, just so you know, that, I, that because we didn't have the slide up, the slides up at the very beginning, um, there is uh, Starbucks cards available for the first three questions that came in. So with that, I see that we have Corey Galloway, Craig Klim, and Dean Stuckman are the winners. So some Starbucks cards will be being sent out to you. And thank with you. that, we'll say thank you very much once again for attending. Uh, appreciate your time and please give us a call. Thanks.